Tommy Vickers, how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm living my best life because you're on the call. Oh, same here. <laughs> <laughs> so we, were, we were just rudely interrupted by Virgin Media's network collapsing here, talking about our joint glorious history. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes, that's where we were. We were exploring. Yes. Dominic and World Sphere Academy. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we were saying, um, I was thinking about, so, so welcome everybody. Um, I've switched on the recording. Um, this will be available on our YouTube channel later. Um, we were talking about, um, I was thinking about welcoming Dominic and I thought when I walked into World Sphere Academy early 2012, he was already there. <laughs> and <laughs> he might not have known it at that point, I'm not sure. But now I hear that he's also known Donna. But I, I remember so many days of multiple mind sessions when we were building our academy and the curriculum that sits in there and, and philosophizing and debating all the concepts of what we will teach our students and what we believe in ourselves and, and how we can build this community. And... Um, you know, the days and the evenings, the symposiums that we would have over wine and, and Christy and Craig getting very excited and drawing on the, on the glass wall um, about what they think and Craig coming back from a conversation with Dominique and then everything changes again and there's new concepts and new things to talk about and new things to think about. And it was such an exciting time. So Dominique, um, welcome. You're part of Walsview Academy. This is quite a special OD talk. We've been doing these every Wednesday since lockdown started somewhere in April. Um, and um, the, 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 the people we have attending today is quite a, quite a special. It really does feel like Chris has said earlier, we, it's like a family reunion. <laughs> so welcome everyone. And um, I'm going to hand over to yes. Chris. To Hello. Yeah, I can okay. hear you again. It's great. Okay. I, thought, I thought it looked yeah. like rose there for a little bit yeah yeah it did <laughs> okay. uh, thank you Lisa. yes thank you Lisa, and thank you dominic for joining us uh, and and thank you for responding to my twitter message that time a while ago because i think like i've been reading your book uh, yes. and it's very long it took me about six months to read it the first time and now i'm halfway through it again yeah. <laughs> and, and every time I think I get it, then I realize that I don't get it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's also that I, I was thinking of the, the difficulty of, um, the difficulty of the work because it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and, and your book itself is a difficult book, but I was saying earlier to the people here that even if your book is difficult, it is already quite a translation of Heidegger. It's easier mm. to read your book than to read Heidegger. Mm. <laughs> For me, in any case. <laughs> uh, and yet, at the same time, you know, when, when you read a book and you get really excited about the book, even it's, it's a bit like reading some poetry. You get really excited and you have a strong feeling in your heart that something is happening here. And you don't quite understand it, but you think this is this is really important, and this is something that that we need to take note of. That's the sense that I that I that I had in reading uh, reading the ontological fundamentals. I'm missing out on some chapter. That it's a uh, that it gives us a way to think differently about the organisation. Uh, and, I, and I think you speak somewhere about the book also as, as a project of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, that it gives us a different way to think about the organization and, and almost two things. The one is if we think, if we manage to embark on this thinking project, uh, there's a new possibility of how we may conceive of the organization. If we don't do it, 
we will remain stuck and we will get deeper into what you call in the book using the Heideggerian term embankment and uh, and we will uh, really uh, we see it around us we will face all sorts of troubles so so there are so many points where we can enter into the book and so many so many questions mm. just had a conversation with Julia uh, uh, now and we started with the question of ethics mm -hmm. uh, and you know this, you mentioned some ethical incidents in the beginning of the book. And uh, here in the midst of the pandemic, we also don't have to look very far for, for ethical incidents and uh, things that we really think like, is this the kind of world that we want? Uh, mm. uh, both, both in the corporate sector and in the public sector. And we have this thing that we have all the laws, we have mm. even more laws, and it's not working. So the question is, where do we start? Where, where, do, we, uh, where, we, where do we start rethinking ethics? Mm. So that we can actually create an ethical organization, bring into uh, existence ethical leadership. Uh, yes. Yeah. And get finally to the point, this thing that you said for, that's for me very provocative. The, it's a name of the one of the chapters of the book also. It's accomplishing the enterprise. Mm. It's sort of broad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to jump in. Yes, well, I mean, so firstly, I, 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 I sort of relate to that book quite similar to you. It's like... I, <laughs> Sometimes go back and say, "Oh, this is interesting." Uh, um, you know, I, I suppose writing the book is a little bit like like running a marathon. You can't quite imagine what you're doing, mm -hmm. and I also go back to it and wonder about it. Uh, and uh, it sort of gets a sort of a life on its own. Um, yeah, and I also forget and go back to the book. <laughs> uh, we wait. It's an opportunity to do mindful breathing exercises. <laughs> yeah, it seems like that. Ingrid, thank you for posting there on the site what we, this whole idea of a work, because that's really central to, to, to the reconceptualization of the organization. So one of the things that uh, struck me from what Dominic says is, um, and Craig also wrote about that in the, uh, in the comments, is, is how we think about organizations is often when we think metaphorically, we think of the organization uh, as something that it is per definition not. So if we say the organization is like a machine, we also saying the organization is not a machine. And then the question is, what is the organization really? Uh, and Dominic goes through this whole thing using the uh, ontological entities of Heidegger, which is uh, physical objects or things like rocks and so on, which are world worldless. And it's, they don't have a world, they're just pushed around by other stuff. And I think there's a lot of that kind of thinking about organizations, organizations as machines or objects. Ah, happily, Dominic is back. Are you? Ah! There you are, back again. But not quite back. Well, maybe, maybe we need to have disembodied Dominique, which is um, just the voice as one of the options if the connection yeah. stays dodgy. Dominic, if you can, uh, try to switch off your... Oh, there you are. Ha! Huh. 
Yes. I wonder, I wonder what's... Perhaps this spirit of technology that is rebelling against this. <laughs> <laughs> Seemingly. The, yeah. Maybe the British Secret Service does not like our conversation. No, because it's massively disruptive, isn't it? No, they don't. Dominic, I, I wonder if you switch off your video. Perhaps that will help. And we were all worried that we'd have load shedding and not yeah. be able to connect. <laughs> yeah, it's quite ironic. Yeah. yeah. yeah you're back, Dominic. I am back. Yes. Even though my Computer says I don't have an internet connection. That is marvelous. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we've found the secret way around uh, the actual uh, internet. Technology. We have bypassed technology. <laughs> we wanted to ask, uh, Craig, Craig said, well, maybe we, we should ask about embankment. And then is there actually a possibility for this embankment? Um, but I guess we'll get there. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, we'll get there. And I, th I think I think it's also interesting that you bring up that 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 concept of ethics right now, because mm. I have sort of been pushed into this ethics conversation against my own will, and now I'm really stuck there. <laughs> Um, because the whole reason this book came to pass is that a friend of mine said, I'm editing this, uh, this series on business ethics and can't you write something that fits in there? And I said, I'm not doing ethics. It's not, I'm, you know, I'm certainly not moralizing about people and all. No, it seems that ah, you will nope. It is the marvel of technology. Yeah. Because my computer still says I have no internet connection. So ethics, Dominic. That, yes, let me just see whether I can make this reasonably stable here in some way. Because it's really amazing that it sort of is packing up right now. I have no idea what is going on with this machine. But at least you guys can see me, right? We can see and hear you. Yes. So without an internet connection then. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I've been pushed into this ethics thing and now I am actually have spent the last few months working on an ethics paper, figuring out how to create actually a proper ethical approach to this. So 
there may well be a very interesting, a very interesting um, in inquiry for us to get into uh, going forward. Um, I'm certainly interested in in sharing my thoughts about it and and seeing what you think. Um, so, what should we use our time our time together for? I would I would love if you if you can take that point of ethics. I mean, in the in the you 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 mentioned that you 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 wrap the ethics idea around the original text. Uh, but on reading the book, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. It really uh, feels that ethics is the central point and also the idea of ethics as, as a boat and ethics as uh, a, a, an ethical organization, as an organization that can be an abode for being human. You can yeah. be human in that organization. Yes. I mean, I suppose, so the fundamental point of the book is to, to, to try to clear up some fundamental understandings. And I suppose the whole book started with actually being in this consulting field that we're all in. And I remember people talking about transforming organizations and not necessarily in the South African sort of racial way, but... Uh, you know, how do you move an organization from being one thing to being another thing? Uh, and I suppose people use that word transform really coming from a, an experience of personal transformation and then saying, how do I transform an organization? And I had this experience over and over again that you train lots of people in an organization and you sort of think if I just change the thinking, and the behavior and lots of people, the whole thing will change. And it didn't. <laughs> I mean, there were things that changed, but you sort of didn't have a sense that the whole organization really changed. And, the, and this whole idea of, yeah, you need to get a critical mass of people and then the whole thing will change, didn't seem to quite work. And that's why I then said, well, if we are able to do personal transformation that would be based on an understanding what a human being is that I found quite powerful. So what's the understanding of an organization that would allow us to do that? And you see that the confusion about organization is endless. And the more you go to, the more you go to highly ranked, business schools around the world as I do and you ask people that question what an organization is the more confusing it gets you really sort of see that <laughs> we don't have a handle on this and I suppose it's a disaster from an academic perspective if you're teaching entire degrees on managing corporates and organization <laughs> and you actually don't know what you're talking about. So, I mean, if you look at the MBA, you just chuck a whole bunch of things there that you sort of say, well, but I'm sure that's useful. Uh, and so it is to, you know, to know about all of those things, but you actually are not, um, are not bringing it together. It doesn't have a coherent foundation. And it is interesting that when I then started to teach the stuff in the book and relate it concepts in an elective people were saying look this is yes. this is great but you should have taught us that at the beginning of the course not at the end because it's now coming together well if you would have taught us this stuff at the beginning we would have had a foundation on which to build everything mm -hmm. um so I suppose from an ethics point of view, the, the current approach, the, the inherited approaches on ethics are, you know, for example, utilitarianism says you need to do things with a view of useful outcomes, you know, or positive mm -hmm. outcomes rather than negative outcomes. But you can't really you can't really take a proper view of what's a good or a bad outcome if you 
don't know what things are. So what's a good outcome for a human being? Uh, most of the things that I thought were good outcomes in my life haven't turned out to be so good. And some of the things that turned out that I thought were terrible <laughs> turned out to be good outcomes for my life. So and I certainly on a personal level, uh, I can see the confusion uh, all the time. Um, and I suppose, if, you know, if we want to understand what is good for people, we need to understand what is a human being. Um, and so the, 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 that's also the project of the book is to say, how, how do we create this foundation um, um, so that when we talk about a good business, what does that actually mean? Um, and so in, 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 in the question of ethics, then the, the, so the question, what is a good company really, it really poses itself in quite a different way. Norm, in the normal, I suppose, capitalistic point of view, we define good as increasing shareholder value, whether that's through increased share prices or dividends or whatever. And so that gives you a certain, as gives you a certain inherent ethics. Um, so while we have the opportunity, why don't I take you through my ethics thought process? I would, it, I would love for you to do that. And I it, see as it stands. around us as well yes. to, to hear how so, you have further then developed this idea. Of yeah. It. So I suppose the first thing about ethics is ethics is a, is the, is a domain of inquiry. So if it's a, it's a domain of inquiry where we're asking the question, what is good, bad, right, wrong, just, unjust. Uh, and, it, and it deals with action. So it's practical philosophy, it, it's what's called practical philosophy and it deals with action it, and to sort of take a view on action really. Therefore, if you, if you say something is ethical or unethical, that's not, really, that's not really appropriate because either something belongs into the field or it doesn't belong into the field. Mm. When we talk about ethical or unethical, what we really mean is moral or immoral. Because you need to have then a certain standard that you set up and say against the standard, this is either meets the standard or doesn't meet the standard. Then there is a really important thing about ethics that's often overlooked that actually only occurred to me a couple of days ago is that ethics then must be necessarily built on, on a notion of what action is. Mm. So you can't have ethics without, without an understanding of what is action. And, um, uh, you know, mostly we, if you, if you go back to Heidegger and in, in, at the beginning of his letter of humanism, he says that we usually consider action only with regards to utility. Mm. So we're saying action is defined by useful outcomes. Uh, and I suppose that makes perfect sense with how we usually think about ethics and certainly how I experience it being debated in the public discourse. Someone's doing something and actually, we're, we're, only say, we're only really acknowledging that something, someone's doing something if there also is an outcome. And then we, say, we ask the question, is it useful or, or isn't it useful? Mm -hmm. And so then really for us, the question that remains is to define usefulness. And I suppose in a business context, usefulness is profitability, shareholder value, and those kinds of things. Um, of course, in other domains of life, we tend to understand it somewhat differently, but, um, and therefore you have these debates where some people say, well, it's useful for me to have a healthy environment and, uh, and others say it's useful to make profits. And sometimes those ideas sort of collide. Mm. So to develop 
to develop a new way or a more original, profound way of doing ethics, one of the key projects would be to look at what, what is action. You know, what's the nature of action? Um, and then any ethical discourse is looking for integrity. Integrity between, you know, here are the things that people are doing and a certain standard that it measures itself against. So that's common to all, as far as I can see, to all ethical discourses is you're looking for integrity between a certain standard morals, principles, whatever you have, or, or you know, and, and certain actions that people take. And once again, for this comparison, you need to, you know, both think about what's actually the right standard and what is action. Um, and so, we, we, I mean, I think that we have, we have maneuvered us into a dead end road right now as, as Western civilization by saying action is only defined by what's useful and increasing corporatization where what is useful is, is, is measured in financial terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and even they are actually in quite narrow terms because we are looking more and more and more just about owners of companies and, and their, their situation. And ridiculously, we are applying this also now to uh, countries, to or universities, even to churches. <laughs> it's sort of it's so ridiculous. You, if you think about it, you just sort of say, what on earth are, are, are we actually doing? Um, and I suppose it's in a way uh, uh, great that we are starting to question this even where it's sort of to some degree at least is, is, is somewhat justified. If you run a business, of course, there is at least some point to be made that people put, you know, start companies, put money into them, take personal risks and therefore should have a return even though, you know, interesting that we are starting a conversation here of how do you actually make an organization sort of this home or abode or place where we can be ourselves and uh, that are just really, really great places rather than, rather than these sort of horrible places <laughs> where we lose ourselves. Yeah. So... Then the, the, the big question from there is how, how do we deal with those two things? So how do we deal with our understanding of action and how, what should we measure ourselves against? And if we talk about what we're doing here, is as, so the, the, the activities that we're looking for is firstly action in general, but then leadership in particular. Because what we're looking for is when we talk about ethics here, is really leadership ethics. Um, so how do we run organization with management leadership ethics? So we're not, we're both looking at action in general, what is that actually? And then what is, what is the kind of action that we talk about for leaders? I mean, not necessarily just CEOs, but I suppose to some degree, everyone's on a call is, is fulfilling some sort of leadership position actually, or has, has some leadership role, whether it's given to you by your position or by just taking on leadership, saying, I have an idea out about this. I suppose that is to some degree already um, sort of a leadership initiative if one makes a suggestion in an organization or pursues a certain idea or vision or something like that. So there is this question about the action Mm. And, and what what is action and particularly what is the kind of action that we call leadership and what is the what is the what is the measure against which we are we are um, looking at this Craig you're 
you're putting a lot of stuff there. If uh, it, it's difficult for me to read and and talk yeah, at the I, same time, I, maybe when, when, someone wants to come in here and say something. Yeah, can we get Craig to jump in? And then there's also a question from Ingrid, and there's also a, a comment and perhaps a proposition from you, Lucille. Um, Craig, uh, the question... Uh, I, 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 Dominic, one of your colleagues at WITS told me that I shouldn't speak, I should write. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just dropping a thought in there. Yeah. Uh, we can come to it later or not. Um, it just helps me to think if I yeah, can Yeah, fine. I mean, yeah, that's great. And I don't want to discourage you from writing. It's just that mm. I can't read and talk at the same time. <laughs> don't, uh, yeah. don't read and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that, Dominic. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I, will, I will keep a question. Uh, look out for the questions as they arise. And then... Uh, yeah. And then... Create a space for 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 Ingrid and Craig and Lucille and whoever else wants to come in and and, and yes. So if anyone has a question right now, uh, yeah, Ingrid, I wonder if you if you want to um, the you ask the question about human meaning making uh, and then how we become more conscious of our thinking. Uh, mm. And I, and I think it gets in there lies the relationship between thinking and action. Mm. And someone like Hannah Arendt is very clear that thinking is not action. And I think she was one of the great critics of Heidegger uh, in terms of not enough said about action. Yeah. Um, it, I don't have, I don't necessarily have the <laughs> answer to that question. I'm, uh, all, I'm, all I'm putting forward right now, firstly, is then is a big, 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 you know, big question is what is action? What is thinking? And if I, for example, talk here, am I thinking with you? Is that action, uh, what, what's actually happening here, for example? Or, you know, are we taking this sort of really basic idea of action where I'm saying only if I'm doing something with my hands, is that, that, is that the only action that counts or is what we're doing here um, an activity and in what way does it count as an activity and what then do we call thinking, which I suppose is me having a conversation with myself. Um, in, and yes, that may in itself, you know, not, not immediately cause something out there in the world, uh, but it does cause something with me. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that that's, you know, that's an an, an important an important thing to get into. Um, I think. You know. Can, can I ask, Christoph? Sure. Yes, please, Ingrid, because I also think I just, you know, in the uh, general uh, flow of misinterpretation, I also just uh, deconstructed your question into some other. <laughs> it wasn't your question. <laughs> so, Dominic, I mean, I don't really know your work. I've been a, a little bit exposed to you know, phenomenology and Heidegger, but I wanted to get a sense from you of um, the relationship between how we narrate ourselves. I know you've got an interest in phenomenological hermeneutics. Obviously, the way we make meaning is very important. Yes. I've been listening to some Gregory Bateson stuff and Nora Bateson, his daughter, about complex adaptive systems yeah. and one of the reasons why they're complex and unpredictable is because our minds and our act of meaning making are part of that system mm -hmm. um, so they're not out there and they're not a thing they're yeah. constituted through our consciousness really or, or we embedded in their creation um, yeah and so I'm interested in, in 
how the idea of a work in I don't know Heidegger enough to say what his conception of a work is but can you try and help me make a link between the idea of a work and other like more contemporary thinking around this kind of thing complex adaptive systems is there a link that I that will help me understand. So the first thing, uh, just a brief comment on, on complex adaptive system is that, you know, that, so this is a way of thinking that came up two, three decades ago, uh, uh, quite strongly. And I suppose the, the important thing for this conversation is, is if we look at all those relationships, just like with systems thinking is, it's worthwhile to look at what's the nature of those relationships that we're talking about because they're not because when we talk about relations between humans they're not normal cause and effect relationships exactly um they yeah. are meaning making relationships as exactly. you, as, as symbolically, you say. yeah so that's a completely different thing to if you're talking about an anthill at least the way we understand an anthill i mean i'm not an ant, so it's a bit difficult to talk about ants. Will be necessarily a little bit arrogant to talk about ants from a human perspective, but I suppose ants have relationships that are not meaning making. They are much more uh, mechanical in that way. Uh, and so, when we talk about complex adaptive system, we must, I think, not confuse one type of relationship in a certain complex adaptive system yeah. to a totally different relationship. Mm -hmm. And you have the same problem with systems thinking is that you could draw causal loop diagrams and there's this arrow and this arrow is of a different nature if it's between you yeah. and me compared yeah. to between two rocks. Exactly. Uh, so that, that's, that's a, and, and often we don't make that distinction and then it, sort of leads us into complete darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the point about a work, so here is Heidegger in three minutes. <laughs> so the, the basic assumption or the basic idea is the hermeneutic circle. And the hermeneutic circle says, I can understand something only if I already have some pre-understanding. And so there is this pre-understanding, this interpretation that allows me to understand something in the first instance. But then when this instance happened, it, it has a feedback loop, so to speak, to my overall understanding. And so there is this loop that I'm moving around as a human being from having an understanding, something happens, this either further reinforces my understanding or changes my understanding, which allows me to understand whatever is happening next in a somewhat different way. Yeah. And, uh, and the way that that was developed was by people observing uh, when they were reading scripture or philosophical texts, or then also legal texts as you read a sentence and you make sense out of that sentence in the context of the entire text and it changes sort of your idea of the text and then you and then it in turn changes what that sentence means so you can do bible studies for a long time and still learn something because in one sentence means something else once you've read the whole thing and read the sentence again then you say oh this now means something different <laughs> and and heidegger basically said that this is what it means to be a human being this is not just a, a, a phenomenon that you have in understanding text but all of life and this understanding he called a world and then there are obviously events in that world that we understand and i suppose ultimately the way I understand what's going on in the globe right now is there are some people who come into this hermeneutic circle as learners and others who come into it as fundamentalists. So either you are looking at an event to justify what you already think and know and what your tradition says, or you use it as an opportunity to develop your understanding ever further. Mm -hmm. 
So what then is an organization? What then is a work? Uh, the idea of a work then comes from a whole, uh, some arrangement, whether that's a piece of art or an organization or architecture or a state, there's a whole bunch of arrangements that keep all these interpretations in place in some way. And so if you go in there, your understanding changes. So it's not something that is over there and you sort of stand here and say, oh, isn't that interesting? No, you understand yourself in it. It's like if you go into a cathedral, you are sort of taken by this experience. It's not like I'm standing here and I'm looking at the cathedral yesterday. You know, I might try to do that, but when a work really does its job, so to speak, it gives you a different reality and also a under, different understanding of yourself. So while I was outside the church, or while I was across the road in the stock exchange, I understood myself in, term of, in terms of personal net worth and, uh, and uh, uh, clever investment strategies. And now I'm walking across the road into the cathedral and now I'm either a saint or a sinner. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's an incredibly helpful analogy. And yeah. If I can just ask a quick question about that. Is then the concept of a work is something once it's constituted a fairly static thing? Because I, I would find yeah. that strange. Like it's an well, I mean, it's, system of meanings. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's... Fairly, it's fairly static, but it obviously can be changed. So if you, especially if we talk about organizations, then, so if you go into worldview, then you suddenly are an employee with a certain rank and, you know, a certain role and certain tasks and you have a certain standing and a certain reputation and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and an organization can only work if it keeps certain interpretations stable. Otherwise, we don't have a basis to, to work with each other. So it needs, it needs to do that. Uh, we need to say someone's the CEO and someone's the, you know, whatever, R&D person. In, in every organization, we give people roles and, and, and hold ourselves accountable to certain people and have a certain understanding of what we're actually trying to do here and, 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 and you know what are we about and you need to keep this relatively stable otherwise people get completely confused but it obviously does not mean that it has to remain the same and so a lot of my work has been about developing analytical tools to define what are the things that are most important in keeping this this world in place so that when you want to move this world forward, at least you know where to look. Yeah. So yeah. is the most important thing how our org chart works or how our office is set up or how re we reward performance or how we conduct meetings or whatever. So it sounds like there the question is, okay, what symbolic uh, constructions hold things together it could yes. be the state the constitution institutions whatever exactly uh, i mean but, it's the but, same with the state yeah so trying to figure out what the core symbolic prerequisites are for creating stability yes yes exactly or or you know like in in south africa we haven't really succeeded with that yet because if you, you, you know that if people go into a mode of emergency, they retreat to their tribe. Uh, you know, the, 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 the South African identity is relatively fragile. Uh, uh, a lot of people even refer to an identity that's outside the country. Uh, you know, or to a, a, or to a very regional tribal racial whatever identity that that in some ways is is overriding the national identity mm. so we, we haven't really managed to set up something and then we have amazing 
politicians who enact that tribal identity even further. And we're so surprised that we don't get the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, and you have the sort of the opposite in the UK where these things have been so established that people can't even imagine that they're any other way. And they behave politically in ways as if this work that you call, say, England can, you know, can survive anything and it can't. It, <laughs> you know, it's like the people sort of think I can just express my opinion without any consequences because you take it so for granted that you can't possibly imagine that it's actually going to fall apart. Mm. Wow. Could, could I ask yeah. a question that's sort of related to that? Yeah. Yes, please, Julia. Um, so my, my sort of background is existential psychotherapy and my area of research is leadership stuckness. Yeah. So it's like, um, and I just, um, I'm really grateful to find you here <laughs> and, um, to be able to use a sort of a verbal representation of your work, yeah. which is easier for me to consume. Than, than having to read, which I will do anyway. Mm. But um, the idea of the hermeneutic circle, so my, my research is in how leaders get stuck. And, mm. um, you know, like that, that Freudian idea of repetition compulsion, mm. um, it, it's like the, the same sort of thing. The hermeneutic circle is how we make new meaning is how we made meaning before. Mm. We, yeah. Is that too far if I was going to now try and wedge those two things together? Because what my research is suggesting is that um, actually it's learning from childhood. Yeah. So, so actually repeating old um, sedimented patterns. Yeah. But taken from the family and into the workplace. Yes. And, and that is what is interfering in the learning rather than people taking ideas from the work i mean this as well but it's yeah it's, there's a big prevalence of early family patterns because of course i'm going through the psychotherapeutic lens That's yes kind of what I'm looking rather than in just baits and learning sort of stuff does that hmm. make sense yeah i mean i suppose the question is how you know if you look at it from the perspective of the hermeneutic circle is what happens that we get stuck in certain interpretations rather than that they are open to interrogation yeah and, 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 and the way that i would put that is how come we stop the conversation so to speak how come i'm not in a conversation with myself about them but rather become sort of just a statement yeah i love that and it's really helpful to my research yeah. um what it's it links to is that um basically we try and wedge ourselves into a corporate in order to get ahead yes and we lose the capacity to have that conversation and it's yes and i suppose that's that's in a way also this whole Heideggerian technology thing yeah. is that there is a whole domain of inquiry that just disappears and, and robs us of our humanity because we're not able to, we're not even able to relate to ourselves as a conversation anymore. All, all of these are just then statements. Thank you. I'm so grateful. It really, really helped me. Yeah. And I suppose, so I've, I've been looking at with this whole ethics and integrity thing is how do you have integrity with yourself? Uh, and I'm interested because I'm sort of looking at that. Um, and I think that the important thing about integrity with myself is understanding myself as a conversation that both totally take seriously how I understand things right now. Because yeah. that's the only place from which I can work and act and lead. Yeah. And at the same time, how do I make sure that I'm not getting stuck there, that I'm not becoming a statement, but rather a conversation? Yeah. 
So what and I, is, sorry, no, I'm and, I, and I suppose what, for example, a narcissist is trying to do is rob you of your own world. Is to discredit your world. Then you have nothing to come from anymore, to lead from anymore, uh, and you know. So you can't be a you can't be a conversation if you don't have a truth right now. You need to both have be clear about your truth right now and be in a conversation about it. And as a leader, you need to be confident about you need to, you need to trust your truth because you have nothing else to trust, uh, you know, and hopefully you're experienced enough and, you know, that your truth actually uh, is, a, is a valid platform to work from and that's all you have. And so if you're just saying, well, I can't be sure about how I understand things, there's no basis for leadership. You need to both say, this is to the best of my knowledge how I understand it and I'm going to act from it decisively and with confidence and clearly and at the same time this also allows me because you know because how i understand it this also allows me to be in a conversation about it because that truth is never an ultimate truth it's always a how i understand things right now emergent so yeah. what i'm loving there i mean i find this so exciting is um that our very own steve beaker who yes. also was put in the whole existential line, but his sort of line is from Sartre as opposed to Heidegger. But anyway, there's... there's. Yeah, well, but Sartre to, was trying to copy Heidegger. <laughs> well, no, no, whatever, whatever. <laughs> from a Heideggerian perspective, he's a sort of a Cartesian yeah, yeah, interpretation yeah. of Heidegger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shall we go down that route? Yeah. <laughs> So, so what's so interesting is um, our sort of work at A4 is around leadership agility and having lots of identities within you. So you have um, things to draw from that allow you agility. And um, this idea that, uh, you know, um, basically, um, if you are a statement, you don't have a lot of identities. Um, so in the Biko sort of sense, Steve Biko, if you have a lot of identities that you pull in and draw yeah. on, to allow you to have agility in the world. And I'm, I'm, I'm just so enjoying making that link with Heidegger. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I suppose we're, we're in the same place with regards to race in South Africa, yeah. where, where people are statements about it. And I suppose the reason why people are statements is because we, we deny them that their, their truth. So they're saying, no, no, but this is true for me. And there are people are saying, but this is, you know, uh, you're stuck and it's not valid and uh, blah, blah, blah. So it's, you know, so you, you need to be that, you need to be, stand in your truth and be a conversation about it. And we <laughs> haven't managed to really get there yet. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Question, Dominic. I mean, uh, yeah. what, what what strikes me uh, is is almost a, a a tension here between the organization and the individual. Mm. Um, uh, Craig mentions here the question of works that ossify and organizations that become. Im I guess it relates also to the question of organizations that become embanked or or embanks. Yeah. Uh, and um, and we come into those organizations with more or less human agency or capacity to act. And uh, and yet we are constrained by by the world, set up by the world. In yeah. this and, and it sounds like the work that you are doing about identifying uh, opportunities or points of intervention in the organization is, is really looking at the world of the organization. Uh, and, but that, that still needs to be done. It yeah. still requires a certain level of agency to go and look at the world. Yes. Is that, is that where the role of the leader comes in? 
I also want to return to leadership and action. Yes, I, I do think so. I think that that's precisely the core of the leadership task, is to actually be in that situation with open eyes. And I suppose that's why also there is so little leadership around, because most people become tools in the pursuit of, of shareholder value. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and there, there, there is a certain level of integrity or agency that just gets completely lost there because I suppose every organization has the opportunity to set up a world much richer than that. And if you narrow it down to just this sort of mechanical pursuit of this sort of, in a way, really weird objective, which is not material at all. It only lives in language, but at the same time, it denies that it lives only in language. Mm -hmm. So we're in, the, in this sort of real uh, uh, dead end road there. And I suppose the first thing is to realize we are in that dead end road. And that, 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 that dead end road is not even good for the shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering about uh, that wonderful uh, description of, of entities that are world poor as having taste relationships. Yes. And way in which our organizations become places in which we, we basically stuck in dazed relationships. Yes. Or, it, or you know, must expect it to be inside dazed relationships and responds to, to respond to behavioral impulses and things like that. Yes, and, and we then also sort of feel like that and understand like that when, when we say things like, I've been working like a dog. It's, mm. a, it's an ex quite an appropriate experience of how I then understand myself and how therefore the relations work. Or, or I'm a cog in the wheel, uh, and we sort of experience that, and we also know that there is something ma massively getting lost there. And we're not saying this as this, this is exciting. We're saying this it, with a profound sense of trepidation and resignation, I suppose, uh, hoping that eventually we will be able to uh, break out of this in some way. I see some, uh, so, um, yes. Dominic. I want to come back to what Ingrid was saying, because mm -hmm. this whole meaning making is, I think, leading us in the right direction of understanding action. Is that when we act, that uh, the, what's really happening is actually an inaction of meaning. Is not just... I'm doing something for an operational objective and then I measure that by its utility, so to speak. But that I'm enacting meaning or to put it in Heideggerian terms, I'm sort of enacting being really, or a truth of being. What do things mean around here? And and of course, particularly, obviously, I think we do this as leaders. You know, if we, if we do something, we do it to set an example to, in technical terms, in the, in the language that Ingrid just introduced, it's uh, meaning making. Um, in a way, we're enacting an understanding of the world, or, or we're enacting a world in what we're doing. And in, and in that world, it is an understanding of what it means to be in the first instance. And so that gives us a different ethics from the start, because we're now saying when I do something, I'm not measuring this by some sort of utility, but I'm asking what kind of, what kind of meaning am I making, world am I enacting, understanding of being am I establishing. And I suppose on the other hand is what, what is the, what is the measure against that? If you are talking as a leader, you're talking about being, being as a measure because you're bringing forth something. So it's, it's sort of figuring out how then those two things work together. How do you create an integrity? Um, and so that's what I'm, 
looking at is how do you create integrity in that interplay between action that enacts a certain meaning, understanding of how, what everything means here, world and truth of being wow. and being truth of being on the other side, bringing forth mm -hmm. something, creating something. And I mean, I suppose creating is an action. So that's, that, that, would, that would be then the kind of action that we, if we, so if we're talking about leaders, it's a creative action. Uh, it's, it's creating something. So we need to look at how do, you, how do you bring together the truth of being here, so to speak, with, with creating. Where is, where is, how do you create the appropriate integrity between the two? What does that integrity even mean? How do you do that? Mm. And then I'm, yeah, Ingrid, you look like you want to say something. I wanted to ask a question about what you've just been saying. Um, is the, the kind of sense that I'm getting from what you're saying is that there's almost like that master slave dialectic where if you come with a narrative and it's fixed and an idea and yeah. you impose it and you apply, yeah. this is the work. Here you are, swallow yeah. this, do that, be that. Yeah. Then, then you're imposing your idea of being and your primacy of being on other people. Yes. And in the domain of the social, if you don't allow for the, the conversation, the openness and the question that emerges in that encounter, if it's an authentic encounter, is what is being. Yes. And then, and if you're in, engaging in that question of what is being all the time, then there's more like genuine kind of epistemic justice because you're taking the other into account as a, 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 a full being. Am yeah. I like on track with what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I suppose in every organization, you need to establish a way of how we work together. You, you, you can't do without that. But I suppose the question then is how do you, you know, how do you create a conversation about that so that you can develop that? And in, in most conversation, this is a, what do they call this? A sort of a taboo, a, a, an unspeakable thing. We're, exactly. not talking, we're not speaking about power. Uh, it's not something to be developed. It's not something to be questioned. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, what a pity. <laughs> this is where Mats Alverson, I don't know if you know him, the organizational anthropologist Mats Alverson is yeah, really interesting yes. on these questions of how the kind of discourses of management that we employ now we mask power by pretending we've got flat organizations and yes. um, the p question of power has become even more taboo because it's, it's concealed. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's like saying all lives matter. <laughs> yeah. And you sort of think that this is the most non-racist statement and at the same time, the most racist statement because you conceal that actually not all lives matter mm -hmm. and that we start completely from different places and therefore what the, the, the statement says exactly the opposite of what you would at first think it says. Fascinating analogy. Perfect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Dominic, that, that, that word, word conceal is interesting because a word that appears often in your book is the word concealment. Mm. Yeah, I need to go back. <laughs> to, I need to read my book again. <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose, you know, the, the, the thing, the, the word that is then introduced is unconcealment, is to look at how do we bring out into the open that which is taken for granted and not articulated. Um, yeah, and I suppose you know, Ingrid, your 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 comment about power and authority and 
rank and that kind of thing is, is, is really helpful because there is always a power dynamic in an organization. And that I suppose, you know, it's not necessarily wrong that there is, or at least, I mean, it's probably right that there are some people who say what we are doing and, or who make the final decision and others who don't. And that, you know, that uh, we sort of think we can take all of this away and that's not possible. The question is whether we are a conversation about it or whether we are a statement about it. And a statement that is actually, you know, taboo. Dominic, I see Lucille, you, you raised the interesting question then of governance and the role of the board. Yes. Yeah, so, so if we're in this conversation around how we work around here, yes. then, there's, then there's this interesting loop into how we think about governance. Mm. Because governance can also be that numbers technical game, or it can be in part that and in part the conversation around the conversation yes. that we're having about how power works around here or how we organize and, 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 and what we organize around. Yes. And yeah, maybe just an observation around that, that I don't think many boards conceive of their role as a conversation about a conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think that our, our, our governance structure is, is seriously flawed because people, especially non-executive directors, don't have an idea of the world of the organization. So therefore have no idea whatever they are deciding will actually mean in the organization. Mm. Um, and we pretend that they do. So, you know, if, if you sit on a board, you will, you will see that you, and I'm not, certainly not talking about your board. I have no idea about your board, uh, but I have worked with many boards and you, and sit on boards. And so you, you get this, this whack of paper with all kinds of numbers in it. And then, and then you're trying to make sense out of what's actually going on. And of course, firstly, a lot of that pack is pure propaganda that is, you know, giving you the view that, someone who puts the pack together wants you to have and then it's a very impoverished notion of the organization because how should you with this information get any sense of what's really going on so i suppose one of the opportunities for us is to figure out how do you how do you create uh, a way of reporting about organization that actually gives you a better understanding of what things mean in the organization how do we, I mean, use a, maybe a trivial sort of MBA language is how do we create a culture survey that lets people know what is actually going on in the organization so that when you make a decision on the board level, you have an idea, will the organization lap it up and say, great, we can't wait to do this, or are they saying, this makes no sense to us, or this is nonsense, or this is bad, or something like that. So I think that there is a whole case for looking at how do you, how do you, if, if indeed you sh want to have outsiders, so to speak, what is the understanding that we can provide to those outsiders of what's going on that gives them any idea, any relevant idea of what is that world and what therefore do their decisions mean in the organization? Mm. And, and if, if, as a, if as an outsider, a non-executive director, I'm speaking into a system that is led from the position of a statement or even a, a, a narcissistic loop yes. around leadership, yes. then, the, then there's a, a huge complication because what I'm doing at a leadership level is to actually rob the board of its capacity to make sense of what I'm doing oh. in the first place. Yes. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> absolutely. And then, you know, and then we have this propensity to, um, to employ narcissists as CEOs and it just makes it ever more, ever worse. Exactly.
exactly. Um, and, and I suppose really the question for us here is what contribution can we make in this, in this game? So uh, how, what contribution can we make in, in the way that companies choose their leaders? What, what contribution can we make in the way that uh, information flows between the organization and the board? Uh, so that the board's really empowered to to provide appropriate guidance. Hi, Christo. Hi, Columba. Hi, hi, it's Nicola. Hi, hi, Dominic. Hi. Um, hi, good to see everybody. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it just uh, just a qu quick comment. Um, I think this disconnect between the executives and the board, um, just doing my MBA and having scoured through many, many annual reports, integrated reports, and really under, analyzed, um, you know, how, it's particularly in strategy, um, how uh, executives would then advise the board about a major strategic decision that will have a significant implication and consequences for the future sustainability of the business. Yes. Um, particularly a global business. And there's just not enough tangible, present, um, real closeness of what is really happening behind all that information that a board member in my view, in the majority of all companies, and I'm not saying all, because there are some where the executives and the board have a very strong, close, interdependent relationship. And their level of conversation and, and dialogue and, and engagement is, is, really, is really part of, 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 of a, of a, of a con continuous process of conversation. Hmm. But most of them, and particularly the listed, the, the, the situation is the board members, um, board meetings are held every quarter, the risk or um, advisory committee and various other committees from a, from a compliance with the JCE uh, stock exchange perspective, meet every reg so often on a regular basis as they need to. And they just get um, about a week to read through the pack of information and the board meeting lasts about three, four hours at very most. And boom, 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 decisions are made. Yes. There's no, I would love to actually read a case study um, where the only topic of conversation is the results of the employee engagement survey with HR or head of human capital in the organization actually leading that conversation with the board. And what that, what the results of that unpacked in conversation mean for the functioning and the effectiveness and the performance of the organization and that and what implications that has for the sustainability of the business. I'd love to read a case study like that, but yeah. I haven't found anything. Yeah. Any remote, anything remotely close. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose for us here, the question is, what could we provide that would improve mm. that situation at least? Yeah. If not possibly sort of, I don't know, the word solve seems to be inappropriate here, but at least make a substantial contribution to that. Mm. And I suppose a business like Worldsview, you know, should be able to do that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yep. Dominica, a question, uh, a theme that seems to be coming up in the comments yeah. is uh, one around identity, leadership identity, organizational identity, uh, how I see myself, conceive of myself as a leader inside the organization. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose this, this whole identity thing, you know, is, is wrapped up in right now in the technological world. And, and that's the sort of important thing about the Heideggerian thinking is that it does away with that Cartesian notion that I'm here and there is the organization in the world, but with that when I'm in an organization, it has a, a, a 
completely profound effect on me because it changes how I understand myself. Uh, it's not something that's outside of me, but we, un but, but if, you, if we look at the Cartesian understanding of, of organizations, they are there. I'm coming in as the, as the superior leader here. I'm forcing my will onto the organization and hallelujah, it now produces larger shareholder return. Uh, which is the measure for my success. In, in a way, there is no leadership in this whatsoever if we define leadership the way that I'm trying to develop it. Um, but it is, an, it, but it is a, a certain type of morality that we're living here that is measured by a certain idea of useful and uselessness. Mm. And therefore defines also then the identity of people who is useful and useless as a person. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I guess all roads lead back to, in a way, to the question of embankment uh, and instrumentalism and instrumental perspective and the possibility for us. You, there's a, a phrase in your book that I love. Uh, it says about ethical leadership, it says it's about the awake, awakening a readiness for a possibility. Huh. And that possibility is something that is per definition not clear. We don't know what it is. We never know what yeah, it is. I mean, I suppose that's really what this whole ethics discourse then is about, is how do I how do I understand what action is and particularly what leadership action is? And it, it is not just, and it, it actually isn't the pursuit of shareholder value. The, as much as, of course, companies need to be financially sustainable and make various contributions to various stakeholders and shareholders <coughs> and managers and owners, etc., need to be one of them. Uh, so that's not, that's not, uh, uh, denied here but that we're doing a lot more and if we do do if we deny all that lot more we as leaders still do those lot more we're just not acknowledging it we're not realizing it just like you sort of say well we need an, an ERP system here and you implement it and you only look at whether it actually functions according to its own criteria and you don't realize that it's changed the organizational culture completely and the power relations have changed and mm -hmm. all kinds of things that uh, were meaningful and valid and motivating to people are suddenly gone and you sort of wonder what happened. And I suppose the idea is first to acknowledge th this is what you're actually doing. You're not just implementing a software a piece of software, you are engaged in a world altering activity here. Mm -hmm. That is actually a creativity, a creative act that is so impoverished that it's not creative any longer, but it's still, mm -hmm. that's the nature of what you're doing. Uh, and so as to bring, to bring the conversation back to understanding what is it that we're actually doing and to look at what, what, should, that, what should that activity hold itself against so that you can create integrity. And so to develop that thought a little bit further is if you look at this whole question of being and on the one side, truth of being, and on the other side, this activity as in acting, meaning a world, a truth of being. I think that, so the, one of the most important one of the most important sentences of Heidegger overall in the letter of humanism is uh, language is the house of being. And so you need to start with establishing a different relation to language and enacting it actually, because language enacts an understanding. So you need to enact a certain way of understanding language. It's sort of the exact opposite of what we're doing in politics on a global level, right? 
what we're enacting is an understanding of language that degrades language to a mere tool to manipulate people to do certain things, mm. rather than enacting language as, as language itself, so to speak. Uh, and I suppose it, it, it starts with being truthful and with keeping your word or at least honoring your word and you know not not giving your word lightly and then being serious about keeping your word and that would be sort of the the almost the uh the pre-work to all of that because you're establishing language as something that that's that operates by itself rather than it's just a tool that is that is a a foundational thing rather than uh, something that I employ. Uh, that, that also changes how I then manage how when people keep or don't keep their word because usually our, our, our response to people not keeping their word is we're saying they're morally inferior and it's not productive. And you know, and of course, you can. It's obvious that it's not productive not to keep your word, but that's not the point here. The point is that you're actually destroying your relation to language, and that robs you of everything as a leader. There's not, there's nothing left if you haven't, if you haven't established a, an appropriate relation to language and have, have established language as language in itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other, the other important thing that Heidegger says in On the Way to Language is language speaks. So language is sort of foundational. It's self-sufficient. It gives rise to everything. And you need to enact that understanding. And I suppose, you know, being serious about giving and keeping your word is sort of the most basic part of it. But you're not keeping your word because it's morally inferior or because it's product because breaking your word is morally inferior or breaking your word is unproductive as much as that's you know certainly unproductive to break your word all the time you can't really work with people but more importantly you 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 establish a relation to language that robs you of, of leadership from the outset i see mena's hand is up yeah uh, this is such an interesting conversation about language. Um, yeah. Um, but Mana, wherever you want to go. Yes, my arm is quite sore now. <laughs> How are you? It's been 10 years. Um, oh just like my one. good Lord. <laughs> I joined the World's View community after you had left and became part of the family as well. <laughs> good for you. So really interesting topic, uh, uh, statement that, and sorry to, to digress, but uh, Lucille brought up the issue of governance and then and Nikki went on about um, uh, being a non-exec director. One of the journeys that I've been on um, after being, uh, for me, I believe that you observe leadership and mm. ethics is set by leadership. So yeah. after having sat on various boards for about 10 years, I realized that something is wrong here. You know, these, these, it doesn't make sense, uh, the ethical component. I'm pushing the ethics, the board is, you know, exactly as per the conversation you've had. So I embarked on a journey of educating myself. So I went to Gibbs and I did the board leadership program. I joined Institute of Directors. Yeah. And that's where I found the fundamental flaw is that most board members who set the ethics in companies are not educated as to what a board is meant to do, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. So in that class at Gibbs of 47 very prominent organizations, people were still asking questions such as, how long does the board pack have, you know, do we have to wait for a board pack? You know, mm. one of the challenges we found is that the Companies Act, which promotes governance the most, or not the Companies Act, I think it's the com yeah, is not actually legal so people don't have to follow it mm. so as much as it has the right way for us to move forward and it's 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 perceived as being something good few companies actually follow it so a most boards don't know how to run ethically and correctly and mm. b 
um, what is governing us? The governance charter is not law. So mm. no one has to follow it. So this behavior perpetuates of yeah. this narcissist and um, the negativity in organizations only because, A, not many people are educated on what, they, what their real responsibilities are with regards to managing, sitting on a board, being a non-exec director, and B, the fact that it's not law, um, the, yeah. the regulations um, that drive ethics. Mm. Um, and that for me has been quite a substantial learning experience. I mean, sitting on non-exec director bo uh, non uh, on boards as non-exec directors, I get my hands dirty, which yes. is something very different to what uh, people do. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Only get involved in organizations that relate to your vision and your values. Yes. You know, you're not going to get involved in something in an ESCOM perhaps, <laughs> yeah. unless you really wanting to <laughs> change the world yeah. or be frustrated yeah so that's what i found to be some of the challenges have any of you found those to be real uh, uh, building, uh challenges in your boards in what's driving ethics in your organization i think mena asked the question of everyone <laughs> <laughs> So everyone is welcome to. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, so it, just to just to add to that. So, how should we be able to f even figure out what governance should work like if we don't know what a company is? Hmm. Th that's of course impossible. And then we have a legal framework that that again leads us into complete darkness. Because in law, we're pretending that companies are human beings. We talk about a legal person and a company is not a person. A company itself cannot take responsibility. It's only people in an organization. You know, so an organization is not the same as a human being. And yes, in law, we've resorted to pretending they're human beings because I suppose that's as good as it got in the legal theory. But, uh, you know, there is, there is an enormous contribution to be made in figuring out how, how should corporate law and governance work, actually, given that, you know, given that companies are either a work or something probably similar to a work, and depending on your on your philosophical disposition. I don't want to get dogmatic about my own view of things or the view that I've developed. Uh, but certainly the one that we're working on is ludicrous. And so it's ludicrous from the bottom up because we're talking about uh, directors being responsible for an organization and we don't know what that is. Uh, and therefore, how, how on earth should we be able to, how should we do to have appropriate corporate law that governs all of this and appropriate oversight and governance uh, is just not going to work. I suppose the opportunity for us here is on the one side to work on the, you know, project of educating the world of what, what an organization is. And, and secondly, to look at what are the tools that we would have to make available for directors to fulfill their task? Craig, Craig, a business before, opportunity there. Craig, before he left, uh, and, and by the way, Craig asked, we must do a part two. So yes. but we'll get to that. Uh, yes. he, he makes the point of all of us. <clears throat> Um, whether board members, whether executives, whether employees, etc., was already existing inside the 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 work that has disclosed the world of the organisation, uh, and and that that's where we already ha are. Uh, uh, and then he makes a point around um, that there's almost an entrepreneurial act required hmm. to shift this uh, and and perhaps that brings us 
to the point of accomplishing the enterprise, accomplishing the enterprise. Uh, we, uh, what struck me earlier um, about works and worlds, uh, when you spoke about South Africa and England, uh, was also this notion that, well, perhaps some worlds are not really that well disclosed. They, they have not yet found a, a clear sense of identity. This is incredible confusion. And then on the other hand, you have worlds that are pretty ossified, that are stuck, that are embanked to the extent where, uh, where they perhaps become uh, uh, very inert in a, in a certain way. Mm. Um, but what are, what are the acts that will, that will shift this? Where is the point of action where, where we as leaders in whatever capacity can, can, can show up, uh, have agency in those worlds within, with, within the world, of course, because we have agency nowhere else. Uh, and what is the kind of action that, will, that, that can affect the transformation of the world? Yeah, I suppose any action really, uh, and and the question is, if we look at any particular action, how, the question would be, how do I need to act to enact a certain world? That, that I suppose that's the ethical question then: mm. is how how do I need to act in a certain in a certain situation to enact the kind of world that I want to establish? And I suppose in this case, we're not just talking about my interaction with you, which is a human to human relationship. Um, I think in organizations, I'm looking more at the kind of creative act to set up a performance management system, for example, uh, which often we do not realize is, you know, has huge ethical implications. We once again, look at it from a useful utility point of view rather than that we're enacting what's important what's not important what's good what's bad what you know all of those kinds of things and we're not looking at all this creating all those setups from the point of view of what is the kind of world that we're creating here and how do we, how do we do that you know and it's i suppose like painting a picture you start to paint and then you see hmm, there's something that's not coming out quite the right way maybe I need to change this line or this color or whatever and to, you know, work, work with it like this. Uh, and, that the, and that the world creating, the setting up a world with what we're doing is, is what, what I'm having my eye on rather than simple sort of workability and utility. Mm. As much as, of course, that needs to still be there. It's just that I'm not highlighting that because we're usually quite good at that in any case. So I, 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 it's just like any, any artist would, any good artist is excellent in all those techniques. So that's, you know, that's obviously a requirement. Um, just like any, any uh, ERP system, you know, needs to be coded so that it doesn't break down and it works and all of that kind of stuff. But we're usually just sort of saying, so how do I make sure that it prints this report the right way? And we're not realizing that what we're doing is uh, uh, we're altering the world with what we're doing. And how do we do that? And how, do, how has it altered the world? How do we need to change it so that it sets up the world that, that, that we need and want? That in, in, in you know, defines us then. We're creating ourselves while we're doing that. Ingrid. Yeah, that's so cool, Dominic, what you're saying now is kind of like a very practical example of how we land this stuff, this thinking in our professional community as consultants <coughs> or coaches and um, so it makes it very real, you know, because we get asked to do things like design a performance management system. Mm. And that is a, a brilliant place of discussion with our clients of what are you actually doing here? What are you yeah. constituting? How do you conceptualize the being of another person? 
yeah. and your potential for coercion or I mean you can just introduce a whole lot of stuff that disrupts that paradigm of control and levers and all the metaphors that they bring to bear yes. so that's a really really wonderful example thank you yes and I suppose then the 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 starting point is to see what are the questions that we should ask when we're doing this so how do we define success and failure and is this how we want to define success and failure in this organization how do we define who we hold ourselves accountable for what do we see as good as and good and bad and all those or beautiful and ugly um are the are, are the important question we usually don't ask them and then we're surprised that it's not working it's the same thing as why we're surprised when we talk about these board decisions and you merge two companies and you sort of say on from a utility point of view the case is clear and uh, then you have these what's in normal consulting speak called culture clashes and everything falls apart and you sort of wonder why did that happen now Yeah, as it does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm. I'm certainly yeah. up for another conversation. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm sure everyone here would would love that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for for this conversation. It 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 went into. Well, <laughs> it's all it had its own flow, and yeah, it, I have, I have it was wonderful with my ethics sort of thought. Uh, I think I've mm. sort of laid out the core, though. But uh, there's, mm. there's, you know, we can go deeper into that. Yeah, um, and of course, it would be interesting to find out what what is it that you're running up against, and use yeah. this as a forum to explore those things. Yeah. So, 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 so I think that's what we'll do. Is the is is this group who joined today? Mm. and maybe extend the invitation a little bit more yeah uh, and then ask ask you uh, our guests uh, what other questions do you want to bring to dominic and 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 what's the next what are we going to have the next conversation with dominic about uh, dominic mm. Uh, yeah, it's because it's it's really fun to have this conversation with you. It is, <laughs> and we want more of it. We don't want me too. <laughs> yeah.